So good afternoon and welcome to the CSP seminar. Um, uh, so I would first like to thank the research areas, um, signal processing and um, NCIS for, for hosting the seminar. And in particular, thank Kate Baldwin and Shelley uh, Feldkamp who are behind the scenes making all of this happen, Kate in particular. So uh, today's speaker is Ziv Scully from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. It's my pleasure to introduce him. He's a graduate student in computer science at CMU, advised by uh, more hardcore Barter and Guy Blalock. Blalock, right? Yeah. So Ziv is finishing very soon and he should be on the market uh, coming up this year. So he graduated from MIT in 2016 with a BS in mathematics with computer science. He's a recipient of, the, uh, of an NSF graduate fellowship and our ARCS Foundation Scholarship. Ziv's research focuses on optimizing and analyzing computer systems and algorithms from a stochastic perspective, including job scheduling, load balancing, combinatorial optimization, and uncertainty on parallel algorithms. Uh, recent publications of his have been recognized with awards from ACM Signatrix, Best Paper Award 2021, Best Video Award 2020, Outstanding Student Paper Award 2019, IFP Performance, Best Student Paper Award 2018, and the Informs of Applied Probability Society, Best Student Paper Prize finalist in 2018. During the COVID-19 pandemic, he served as an algorithms consultant for the Novel Exposure Notification Project. With that, I give the floor to Ziv. Please go ahead. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you, Vijay, for the introduction. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thanks to Lei Ying for hosting me. Um, and I've had a great time meeting with people over the course of today. I have a few more meetings tomorrow and I'm looking forward to those. Um, so what I want to do in this talk today is, is kind of twofold. So first, um, so first I'm gonna be um, telling you about kind of some recent, uh, some recent results we've gotten basically applying queuing theory to uh, to some uh, problems that kind of are inspired by computer systems, especially uh, things that occur in uh, settings like networks and scheduling, uh, and scheduling for the for networks and settings like data centers. Um, and then at a high, higher level, um, I'm a, gonna a little bit try and pitch basically that uh, uh, I, I think queuing theory has a bit of the, uh, queuing theory, which is like my field, has a bit of a reputation for kind of making lots of assumptions and so do the results you know even mean anything for real computer systems and uh, what I kind of hope to show is that uh, kind of with you know recent developments in queuing theory um, that we're gonna we're getting a lot closer to being able to you know model more and more aspects of complicated computer systems uh, than we could in the past and that's been a kind of major theme of my research so I'm going to start with a bit of an overview of queuing theory and just like generally what my sort of research is about. And then I'll get into the main topic of today, which is a couple of specific scheduling problems that we can attack using these new queuing theory methods. So with that, uh, um, I should say all of this work, all the work I'm going to talk about today um, is uh, done with many great collaborators. Um, so my main collaborators have been my, uh, one of my advisors, Mo Harpo Balter at CMU, also Alan Schellerwolf, who's in the business school at CMU, um, and my colleague Isaac Grossoff, who's another student of more Harpo Balters. Um, and then I've uh, also worked with many, many other great collaborators. There's a, one paper in the ref there's a paper in the references that has, um, that's with these folks uh, from Caltech and the Netherlands. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, so today is gonna be a lot about cues in computer systems. So just to make sure everyone's on the same page, I'm going to explain kind of what a queue is. So at a very high level, a queue is some setting where you have jobs of some type waiting for service of some type. So in computer systems, there are lots and lots of examples of queues. So you can think of a file server as a queuing system where the jobs are requests for files and serving the job means, you know, loading that file from disk and sending the contents to whoever requested it. Databases, another great example. So the jobs might be SQL queries or queries in whatever language the database uses. Serving that job means you know, parsing the query, compiling it, 
executing that query and then sending the result back to the user. Network switches are another example of a queue. This one's a bit of a kind of a um, a little bit of a different uh, angle than the others. Here, uh, one way to think about a network switch is the jobs are packet flows. So various clients want to send you know a series of packets through this network switch, and um, so we can think of a job as like an entire series of packets, and serving that packet is going to be uh, serving that flow means transmitting all the packets. In it. Um, of course, operating systems, there are lots of different jobs that might be running um, in an operating system. And so we think of the job as the OS threads and serving means running on a CPU pool. And so what queuing theory is all about is basically studying the essence of jobs waiting for service. And so it's kind of queuing theory typically works by abstracting away lots of details about the specific queuing systems. Just think about jobs and service so that we can draw general conclusions. So what I'm going to do uh, now is I'm going to introduce kind of one such mathematical model of queuing systems that kind of abstracts away a lot of the details. Um, and don't worry, we're going to add some of those messy details back in later um, to get some interesting system scheduling problems. So the model I'm going to tell you about is called the MG1 queue. So this is kind of um, kind of baby's first queuing model. It's got a single server, which can serve one job at a time and a queue that can hold any number of jobs waiting for service. So um, in this talk, I'm going to draw jobs as test tubes for the most part. So a test tube is a job. Its height is going to denote the size of the job or its service requirement. That's how much time we need to serve the job to complete it. And I'm going to represent serving a job as filling the test tube with water. And so at any moment in time, there uh, we might have made some progress on a job already. Um, and so we're going to denote that amount of progress. Uh, we're going to call that amount of progress the job's age. So age is the height of the walk, the amount of time we've served the job so far. And then the rest of the job we'll call it remaining size. And so uh, one, one kind of uh, core, core tenet of queuing theory is that uh, for the most part, we model things stochastically. Because in, in, real, you know, in real life, large scale systems, uh, things happen you know, uh, more or less at random. Um, as opposed to say adversarial or something like that. So we're going to assume we have a random arrival process that generates these jobs that are left. And uh, the MG1, uh, what that means is it basically specifies the exact type of a of random arrival process. There's some going to be some size distribution S, um, some average arrival rate lambda, and we'll have arrivals up as a Poisson process. And then this gives the system load. Uh, lambda times e of s. So load the load. Um, okay, in uh, okay, laser pointer showing up. So yeah, so the load of the system is the fraction of the time the server is busy, um, and this fraction should be less than one because you can't have the server be busy more than all of the time. Um, so load less than one is required for the system to be stable. Um, people also sometimes call load the utilization of the system. Okay. So that's the kind of uh, type of queue we're going to be talking about today, this queue with random arrivals um, and a single server. And we're specifically going to be talking all about scheduling. So a scheduling policy simply picks a job to serve at every moment in time. And we're going to study preemptive scheduling for the most part. So that means that any moment we can switch with job is in service. And when we do this, uh, we don't lose any progress on the job that we preempted. So we're going to keep all that progress. Um, we're also initially going to assume that uh, preemption can happen instantly. OK, um, so this is the kind of basic model we're talking about, the single server queue. And the objective we're going to be shooting for when we're uh, designing our scheduling policies is going to be response time. So a response time of a job is the time from when it first arrives to when it leaves all complete. And, and this includes both time the job is in service and time the job is in the queue. And because the and because the scheduling policy affects when the job is in the queue and when it's in service, the job's response time is going to be greatly affected by the scheduling policy. And so our goal specifically is going to be to schedule to minimize mean response time and other metrics to do with response time, but mostly mean response time today. So um, as a as a kind of warm up, I know many people will have seen this before, uh, but let's just do a quick warm up. Um, so. Let's say, um, let's say we've got uh, these four jobs in our system right now. 
Um, and we have you know, more jobs randomly arriving over time. And let's say we know exactly how big each job is, and we know exactly how much we've served each job already. That is, we know every job's size, age, and remaining size. So if we have all of that information, which job should we schedule first if we're trying to minimize mean response time? So uh, if you're in the audience, you can either use the Zoom raising hand or you can just unmute and shout out the answer if you want. If no one answers, I'll answer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll wait for people. I think a greedy way would be to just pick a job with the smallest uh, amount of time that is remaining. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So if you're when, so the, so is it uh, Numan? Yeah. Numan. So Numan suggests, yeah, uh, serving the job of least, we're going to call that uh, remaining size. And yeah. uh, this is exactly, this is exactly the optimal policy. That's um, also known as SRPT, which stands for shortest remaining processing time. And, um, and the reason SRPT is the right thing to do, uh, the into at least the intuition I have is that um, if you're trying to minimize uh, mean response time, the average amount of time um, jobs are waiting in your system, that turns out to be equivalent to minimizing the like number of jobs waiting on average. Um, this is because you can imagine like um, you can imagine that you have to pay one dollar for every minute a job is in the system, and so you're just trying to minimize the total amount of money you spend. And so by cho choosing the job with the least time remaining, you're basically getting one job out of your system as quickly as possible. And so you're gonna stop paying money for that job as quickly as possible. And so um, using kind of intuition like that, it's not too hard to formalize that to show that SRPT minimizes mean response when you have known sizes and known ages and known remaining sizes. So what if we have unknown job sizes? So what if we don't know the heights of the test tubes? So um, now scheduling becomes a kind of trickier problem. Um, in fact, it's not even totally clear what information we have to use in designing a scheduling policy. So um, I guess second question for the audience, can anyone think of information that we might be able to use when deciding which job to serve? Um, let alone, you know, don't worry about exactly how we're going to use that information, but just what information do we have available when we don't have sizes? And a hint is that one of the pieces of, there are, there are at least two pieces of information. One is on the slide, the other is not. So anyone have one or both pieces of information to suggest? So Dave, uh, can we guess the remaining size or not at all? Okay, so Lay suggests guessing the remaining size. So the pieces of information I'm thinking about will help us guess the remaining size. That's exactly right. Um, but uh, so the so I guess another way to, another way to frame my question is what pieces of information available to us could we possibly use to guess remaining size? I guess it depends on the distribution, right? Or what assumption we make on the distribution of the file size? Okay, yeah. So Lay suggests using the fact that the job sizes are drawn from some distribution. So that, that's gonna help us guess exactly how long each job is, or uh, help us guess each job's remaining size. Um, the other piece of information we have available to us in addition to the distribution is each job's age. So even though we don't know how long each job is going to take, we can measure how long we've served it so far. And then as Leslie suggested, we also, um, it's reasonable to assume that we have a Either, either know the job size distribution or at least have a good approximation for it, uh, perhaps based off of like historical data. Um, and so, and so um, scheduling with unknown job sizes amounts to exactly as uh, Lay suggested, using the job size distribution and each individual job's age to kind of guess each job's remaining size. And of course, we're gonna get a distribution for each job's remaining size. And it's not totally clear how we should compare like distributions of remaining sizes. It's not as simple as just 
you know, five is less than three. It's, you know, this distribution less than that distribution. It turns out though, that there is a way that, you know, people have studied this problem um, and queuing theorists have figured out how to schedule optimally in this case. And there's a some policy called the Gittins policy, which in a kind of complicated way assigns each job a numerical rank or priority based on its age and the size distribution. Um, and we're going to use the convention that lower number is better. So, for example, Gittins might assign this job rank four, that job rank three, this job rank five. And it'll serve the job of least rank, which in this case is the job of rank three. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about Gittins later in the talk. And so, um, and it's much more complicated to prove than for SRPT, but you can show uh, that with this complicated definition of rank, Gittins uh, minimizes mean response. It basically, it basically is through its very careful choice of priorities. So, uh, Ziv, is there some um, intuitive way of explaining why it shouldn't just be the conditional expectation? Or, um, so the okay, Vijay asks, is there why shouldn't we just use the conditional expectation? That is the expected remaining size. I'm going to come back to that later in the talk. That's going to be uh, we're going to go into some depth about what the difference is and whether using expected remaining size. Uh, just taking expectation rather than doing this complicated rank three thing, we'll talk about whether that's a good idea or not. Um, so I'll put that on hold. It's a good question. Though. So, so basically, the what we have is that we have that, um, you know, I've told you about the single server scheduling uh, problem, and I told you that SRPT and Gittins minimize mean response time. SRPT, when you have known job sizes, and Gittins, when you have unknown job sizes. Turns out Gittins is actually this really general thing and also applies when you have partially known sizes. Um, in fact, Gittin, SRPT, you can kind of view as a set special case of Gittins in a way. So, um, so it even works when you have known sizes. So in light of this, why don't we use Gittins or as a special case, why don't we use SRPT in computer systems? And this is where I'm gonna get, um, connect things back to computer systems because there's a lot of things that go, there are a lot of assumptions that, that we make in queuing theory that go into Gittins' optimality that aren't necessarily true in computer systems. So I'm going to make a list of some assumptions and the contrasting reality on this slide. So one, um, one assumption we've been making so far is that we're scheduling on a single server. But of course, you know, if even, even my phone probably you know, has several cores um, so, you know, even the very smallest computers are now multi-server systems, uh, thinking of each, you know, uh, I'm thinking of each, uh, each individual core, um, is kind of like a server from a queuing perspective. Um, another thing that I alluded to is that, um, this Gissons policy is kind of complicated and and, um, you know, in theory, that's fine. You know, if we can write down a mathematical expression, no matter how complicated, that's good enough. We solve the problem, prove the theorem. Um, but in practice, you probably want something that's simpler, um, maybe a bit easier to understand or easier to implement, easier to maintain. Um, or, um, and, and for many reasons, you prefer simple implementations. Um, another thing, uh, I mentioned that so far we're assuming that we can preempt jobs at any time with no cost. But um, in practice, it might be that preempting a job um, is not free. It might be that um, either you know it costs you know some amount of time to preempt, preempt a job, or maybe we can only preempt a job you know at certain uh, specific points in time. Um, so there are various reasons we might not be able to preempt free. Um, Another, another uh, aspect of the scheduling policies I've talked about so far is that all, all of them have had basically um, what I call arbitrarily many priority limits. So for example, in SRPT, uh, we can use a job's remaining size, which can range, you know, I mean, in theory over a continuum, you know, you know any real number could be a job's remaining size. Um, in practice, you might still have, you know, some number of microseconds or something. And so you have this really fine granularity of priorities. But there are many systems um, where, in practice, you actually only have a small number of priority levels to work with, um, something like four or eight priority levels. This can happen, for example, when scheduling in a network switch. Okay, and then finally, 
the thing that Gittins and SRPT are good at doing is minimizing mean response time. But, um, but in practice, mean response time is not usually the metric that people care most about. They care a lot about other uh, response time metrics, um, like you know, not just mean delay or mean response time, but the tail latency, uh, the tail of response time, or, you know, or the variance of response time. Um, other more complicated metrics. And so basically um, handling all the stuff on the left, you know, is from a theory perspective, relatively easy. You know, we've already said Gittins solves the problem. SRPT solves the problem if you have node sizes. Um, but in Rick, but in incorporating all of these realistic aspects of computer systems is much harder to do from a QE theory perspective. And so what my research does kind of at a high level is I work on inventing new queuing theory tools for addressing these practical obstacles um, that occur when in scheduling problems in real computer systems. And so, and so what I'm going to tell you about today is, well, I'm going to, what I'm going to tell you about today is basically, um, well, first I'm going to tell you at a high level, you know, uh, how some of my work has addressed these obstacles, and then I'll go in depth into three. So um, over the course of my PhD work, I've introduced two big new tools that help us attack these problems. Um, so the first new tool is called SOAP. And um, SOAP is basically a kind of new way of analyzing scheduling policies. And in particular, analyzing a much wider variety of scheduling policies than we previously knew how to do. And so um, all some of these uh, aspects on the right um, kind of end, you know, end up kind of uh, like, for example, if you're scheduling with a limited number of priority levels or restricted preemption, those results in much more complicated scheduling policies than we previously knew how to analyze. And SOAP is going to help us analyze those. Um, then another, another uh, new tool that I've developed, which I'm not going to talk too much about today, um, is something called R work, which provides a new way of understanding it. And so I've applied SOAP to most of these problems on the right. And then our work is, turns out to be important if you want to think about multiple servers. And so for the rest of today, um, so I just wanted to give you kind of an overview of kind of um, how um, you know, my collaborators and I at CMU are kind of attacking these problems. And then for the rest of today, I'm going to focus in on these middle three and how, we're, and how we use SOAP to, um, to tackle problems of uh, having a simple scheduling policy, uh, handling restricted preemption, and having a limited number of priority levels. Um, if you're curious about the other two problems, um, uh, we, I refer you to some papers and that there are references at the end of these slides. And I'll post these slides on my website um, later today. Okay, so for the rest, this will be our outline for the rest of the talk. I'm going to start by talking about what SOAP is and then address uh, these three problems. So, um, so let's get started by uh, maybe maybe I'll pause for I'll pause briefly just in case there are any questions and if not then or and then once we're done I'll keep talking about so. Okay, so let's talk about what this soap thing. So SOAP stands for Schedule Ordered by Age-Based Priority. And it's really, SOAP consists of two things. First, it consists of a really broad class of scheduling policies. And then SOAP also consists of a universal method of analyzing, analyzing the response time of any policy in that broad class. And so I'm now going to describe what that broad class of scheduling policies is. So a SOAP policy is any job, sorry, any scheduling policy where a, a job's rank can, or priority uh, can be described as a function of its age. And remember, the age of service so far. Um, so an example, so um, some of the policies we've talked about already are SOAP policies like SRPT and PSMs. Um, another example of a SOAP policy um, is one called foreground background, or FB. So FB is the policy where a, as a job's age increases, its rank increases, which means its priority 
we're using the convention, lower priority is better. Its priority, to, in, its priority gets worse and worse with age. So foreground background um, always serves the job of least age. That's how this rank function encodes a scheduling policy. And so basically what SOAP is, is it's the, um, you know, I don't, I can draw basically any wiggly rank function I want, and that's a SOAP policy. So FB is just one simple example. In fact, um, in fact, SOAP uh, uh, jobs rank can depend on actually a little bit more than just its age. It can also depend on sort of static information about the job. So in one example is maybe we've got two types of jobs, normal jobs and urgent jobs. And so a, the preemptive priority policy might give urgent jobs uh, better priority than normal jobs. Um, and so preemptive priority is a SOAP policy. Um, if you're wondering what we do when there's a tie, we're going to use a convention. We break ties first come first. OK, so that's preemptive priority. Um, another example of a SOAP policy where that uses some static information about each job is SRPT, which we've seen already. So SRPT is always serving the job of least remaining size. And so the rank of a job is its remaining size. Uh, specifically, a job's rank starts at its original size and then goes down at slope one as we serve the job more and more. Gittins is another example of a SOAP policy. It's just a lot more complicated. So what SOAP does, so, so, so this is this class of SOAP policies. And what the SOAP analysis does is it basically says, given any rank function, I can do a bunch of math and get a mean response time formula. And that's a formula that's exact. Um, hey, uh, Zif? Yeah. yeah, if I may interrupt, I have a, a quick question here. So you said SRPT is a is a type of SOAP policy? Yes, it is. Uh, so here, the SOAP policy you said is a policy which depends on uh, the age. But I guess you also say it depends on static information. So the file size, I guess, will be the static information here for SRPT. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, so, um, mm -hmm. so yeah. This set, so basically, the, the key, the thing that makes SOAP policies work, or, or the class of SOAP policies basically says, um, when you arrive, when a job arrives, it can have some sort of static information, like a tag. So the tag of the job might say, this job is, has this size and is urgent, or something like that. And so preemptive priority will, preemptive priority is the kind of trivial SOAP policy that just looks at the tag. And if it's urgent, it has low as low rank, if it's normal, it has high rank. SRPT uses the tag in a slightly more complicated way where you, know, you start at your size and then you go down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's good. good. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so for the most part today, I should say that um, the, I think mo all of the SOAP policies in this talk are either only going to use age or are going to uh, similar to SRPT, use a job size and its age. Um, but SOAP is even more general. Okay, so, so yeah, so I've said that uh, basically the SOAP analysis takes any rank function and spits out a mean response time formula. I mean, it actually also gives uh, higher moments of response time. Um, and so you can, doing some work, you can get bounds on the tail of response time. Um, so, uh, this is a quick question. I mean, even, yeah. I mean, even though this is a general class of policies, I mean, just knowing the age might be a lot of computation because there are a lot of jobs. You have to basically have a counter that counts down for every job, right, in some sense. And is a complexity wise how, I mean, since that was one of the concerns that you had yeah. in your design, it's still not, I mean, it's still not, how would I say super simple? Because I have to have a counter for each job, which is basically counting down how much time has gone by and how much is remaining in the age. Right? Yeah. Okay, so that's a good, so the question is basically, is knowing the age of each job itself a pretty complicated thing? For the most part in this talk, we're gonna assume that keeping track of ages is easy enough. Um, we, uh, we actually do have a paper. So the SOAP paper appeared in Sigmetrics in 2018. In Allerton in 2018, uh, we actually had another paper that asked exactly the or a very related question to what Vijay is asking, which is, what if instead of knowing each job's exact age, you only have approximate ages? And we show how to sort of make take any SOAP policy and make it robust to only knowing approximate ages. 
in a way that or that is guaranteed to not degrade response time too much. Um, and I can talk more about that afterwards. But for, for this talk, we're going to assume that knowing the ages is easy enough. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff that's complicated that we are going to simplify that. Way. Okay, so that's um, a kind of quick introduction to SOAP. And so I'm now going to explain how we use SOAP to solve these problems on the right. And I'm going to start with the problem of scheduling with a limited number of priority levels. And so SOAP is actually a really natural tool for studying this problem, because when you're scheduling with a limited number of priority levels, that means that, you know, uh, that uh, it, it basically means that your rank functions are going to take only finitely many values. So um, one, one context in which this happens is in which you want to schedule with only a limited number of priority levels is, say, a network switch. Um, so in a network switch, um, you know, it's built into the hardware. Uh, there might be a finite number of buckets. And whenever you send a packet to a network switch, you have to, you have to say, uh, you know, which priority bucket is going to go in. And your hardware might have only four or eight uh, buckets. Um, and that's not an easily expendable thing. Um, a similar thing happens in, uh, like, I think it's the Linux scheduler, um, where, you know, by default, there are six priority levels or something like that. So having a, you know, having a small finite number of priority levels is something that shows up again and again in computer systems. And so we might ask, you know, how can we adapt scheduling policies to use a limited number of priority levels? So, um, so to start with, it's, it's pretty easy to, like, write down, um, it's pretty easy to kind of, you know, given a scheduling policy, at least come up with, you know, perhaps with some arbitrary choices, squishing that policy into a finite number of levels. So, for example, um, I'm gonna we might squish SRPT, which you know schedules job by remaining size. Um, we might squish it into three priority levels based on a job's remaining size. So maybe all jobs with small remaining size get rank one. All jobs with medium remaining size get rank two, and all larger jobs get rank three. So what this looks like is small jobs, their rank function ends up looking like this. Medium jobs have a rank function that looks like this. Starts at rank two, then jumps down to one when they have size two remaining. Large jobs um, and, uh, start at three, then jump down to two, then jump down to one. And I should emphasize that um, the amount of time a job spends on its initial rank depends on its size. So a really large job has a rank function that has an even longer time to rank through. And so we're going to call this type of policy, that's kind of a step version of SRPT, we're going to call it LPL SRPT, standing for Limited Priority Level SRPT. And so it's not too hard to define LPL SRPT, but there are a whole bunch of questions that it raises. So one question is, how many levels do we need, right? Is three levels enough? Do I need more? You know, how expensive of a network switch do I need to buy if I'm going to try and implement LPL SRPT in my network switch? Um, on the previous slide, I chose the size. I chose the cutoffs. You know, what was small, medium, and large. I chose those arbitrarily. How should we choose the size cutoffs in general? And then lastly, um, LPL SRPT is kind of the, the a, a very natural choice that kind of directly takes SRPT and kind of discretizes it into finitely many priority levels. Um, but we might ask, is that actually the best way to adapt SRPT? Is that the best policy? Can we somehow do better than LPL SRPT? And so none of these, all of these questions are like important questions in practice, and none of them, and none of them have been studied before. Um, and they are not uh, from a theory perspective. And they're also like they don't have obvious answers. So so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk through how we applied SOAP to basic and basically did lots of uh, numerical, I call them numerical experiments. So these aren't like simulations, but these are uh, kind of analyzing using the SOAP formula. We're going to analyze LPL SRPT, and we're going to come, uh, come to some interesting conclusions about all of these questions. So I'm going to start with how many levels do we need? So. Um, Jim, I had a question on this yeah. slide. Yes. Uh, the previous one. So uh, could you uh, explain again uh, how this is SRPT because you are plotting the rank versus age, but SRPT considers the remaining time, right? 
That's a, okay, yes. So the question is uh, basically, uh, yeah, how does this uh, plot correspond to remaining time? So let me actually go back to the slide before this. So the short ver the short answer is that um, that that illustration is not complete is not complete. So um, so oh sorry right. So LPL SRPT looks different basically depending on a job's initial size. The exactly when the steps down occur are going to happen at different times. So for example, a small job starts on the lowest step, you know. A uh, medium job steps down after a bit, and a, uh, and a you know a large job will have three steps. And of course, when that those those steps happen depend on a job's initial size. On this slide, I've just illustrated one example, um, but really, because um, really the rank function is like a two-dimensional thing that I just didn't want to draw on the slide. Does that help uh, help answer yeah. your question? Yeah, I wanted to clarify this. Thank you. Thanks for asking that. Okay, so I'm going to start with the question, how many levels be? Um, so, and what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you a plot um, where uh, basically for two different distributions, these are both high variance distributions, uh, job size distributions. Um, I have I've, um, picked a kind of, I've, for now I've picked a heuristic for choosing, um, for now I've picked a heuristic for choosing exactly how uh, where this where this size cutoff should be. Um, this heuristic is taken from the systems literature, um, and I'm going to plot uh, basically mean response time uh, of this heuristic for choosing size cutoffs when you give it two levels, three levels, four levels, and etc. And um, what we find out for both of these high variance distributions is that um, having is that Basically, there is a pretty there's a pretty quick convergence, and once you reach a wrap, and so so specifically, what I'm plotting here is the mean response time ratio relative to SRPT. So, what this what this means is that um, what this means is that when you have two levels in this bounded gradual case, um, uh, LPL SRPT is six times worse than normal SRPT when you've got two levels. But when you've got three levels, now it's only twice as bad. And you know, once you've got five or six levels, it's only 20% or 15% or 10% worse than SRPT. And something similar happens for a wide bulk distribution. And so, and so, and we've done this for a couple of different distributions, and we've seen that very roughly speaking, you know, five, maybe six levels is enough to, is the point at which you start seeing diminishing returns. And so once you have five or six levels, um, you've, um, you're, you're pretty close to the performance of true SRPT. And so you don't need to worry about having too many more levels than that. Um, when you have low variance distribution, and oh, sorry, I should say something though, which is that when you have, only, when you have high variance distributions, um, you might think, oh, two levels you know, is you know, six times worse than SRPT. But um, this is still way better than having only one level. And doing first come first serve. First come first serve, um, uh, it would be completely off the chart. With that um, it would be around seven hundred for the bounded Pareto, and around like seventy uh, for this wider distribution. I forget if it's exactly seven hundred, but it's somewhere in the hundreds. So even just two levels is already a huge improvement over first come first serve. And once you hit five, five or six levels, uh, you're basically as good as SRPT. Um, Quick yeah. question. Is there any way that does the levels depend on the load, or do you is not does not depend on the load? Or... Good question. So the heuristic, I'll talk about the heuristic on the next slide, but it does not depend on the load. Um, the exact numbers do depend on the load. Here I'm showing load at eighty percent, um, but uh, you see, basically, it's very similar patterns for lower load and higher load. But in heavy, what about heavy traffic? I mean, do you? So in heavy traffic, um, so okay, in the limit as load goes to one, yeah. if you keep your bucket thresholds constant, then there is, then you are guaranteed to eventually be like asymptotically worse than SRPT, um, because SR, 
basically because you will have a one over one minus row term in the mean response time of this finite level thing, whereas SRPT can do asymptotically better than that. But that's completely unavoidable. That's unavoidable. Um, and so that's actually partly why we, we don't have like a theorem here that says we're always in this, uh, but this is just a like a series of many numerical experiments combining, uh, which all use this kind of previous theory work that gave us the formula that allowed us to do these experiments. Doing lots of these has, draw, has given us this conclusion. So, in, so maybe in methodological question would be you took the theory expressions and minimized as, and chose these as opposed to, um, and then and then verified with experiments as opposed to um, just using the experiments and running. Um, sorry, can you say that? I think you cut out for the first part of that. Can you? Oh, sorry, that? I was just saying you. Uh, so methodologically, when you obtain these uh, the divisions and the levels, uh, you could. You use your theory predictions for the response time. You have response time predictions for both, and you use that to determine good numbers. Or did you do these exclusively on experiments, and then sort of verify okay. that? Yeah. Right. So, so yeah. Let me clarify the methodology. So the methodology for these numbers is so the SOAP analysis basically says if you've got an MG1Q and, and this rank function and this job size distribution and this load then here's an exact formula for mean response time. And so what we did is we just chose specific distributions. You know, uh, I'm showing you two here. We chose several loads. We chose, we looked at many ways of setting the size cutoffs. Um, I'll talk more about setting the size cutoffs on the next slide. But we basically uh, given, and once you specify the exact distribution and the load, then it's just numerical integration to come up with these numbers. All right. Um, does you. that answer? If you have an exact expression, so you don't need to do any simulation. Right. Things. Now, now I will say that. Um, so I was so this limited priority. This one of the recent uh, systems papers that is about basically adapting SRPT to a limited number of priority levels. Um, I spoke with some of the authors of that paper, and uh, even though they were kind of you know they were in a real system and they you know which is even more complicated you know even more complicated and they were trying to optimize tail latencies and not just the mean. Um, they actually came to many of the same conclusions uh, that uh, that we came to using. So, um, so I think that even though this is still a pretty simplified model, it is starting to approach what's uh, useful in practice. Anyway, so this is high. This is the high variance story. Once you've got five or six levels, you're good. you're basically as good as mean as SRPT for mean response. When you have low variance. Uh, it's even, it's like you need even less. Once you have two levels, you're basically there, um, which is maybe unsurprising because it turns out schedule, everything's a bit nicer when things are low variance. Um, by variance, I mean the job size distribution. Okay, so that's how many levels you need. Um, so far, I've swept under the rug how we're choosing the size cutoffs between these levels. So let's talk about that. So I'm going to compare, so I'm going to show you kind of some more plots, same. Same format as before, but now there are going to be two colors. We're going to have in blue a, a, a heuristic for choosing the size colors. And this heuristic, which has been used in, used in uh, like the system paper I was talking about before and other systems papers before it, is basically to, what, if you have the job size distribution, to balance, to choose the size cutoffs in a way that balances the load in each size bucket. So basically, if you've got three levels, Make it so that a third. Make it so that a third of the load is it starts in the first level. A third of the load starts in the second level, and a third of the load starts in the third level. Um, and of course, another thing you could do is we have a formula. So you know we could just numerically optimize and find the best cutoffs, and so we did that as well. Um, so these heuristics are actually independent of the system load because uh, basically. If you put a third of the, if you, I, I know I said you put a third of the load in each bucket, but all the buckets will kind of scale together as you increase the overall system load. So these heuristics don't depend on the system load. The optimal cutoffs do depend on the load. Um, and, and so, and nevertheless, what we find is that this heuristic of choosing, uh, of, of balancing the load between the size buckets is, is pretty close to optimal. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. 
especially for the uh, bounded Pareto distribution. And, um, and moreover, uh, in some other plots that I'm not showing, we tried some other heuristics that kind of seemed natural and they were all way worse. So, um, so this is kind of some more validation of kind of what, um, what the systems people had kind of discovered empirically. Um, we, uh, we kind of plug that into the formula and that turns out to be at least the best simple heuristic and pretty close to what's uh, optimal even. And in, that's particularly impressive given that it's one fixed set of cutoffs that you don't have to change uh, as, this, as the load goes up or down. So this load balancing heuristic is a pretty good way to set the size cutoffs. Um, I know I'm, I kind of only briefly defined what the heuristic was. Um, I'm happy to clarify more after the talk. If Just a want. quick uh, question again. I mean, this is again, uh, how easy or hard is the numerical optimization problem? Is it, is it a good structure or is it basically some complex nonlinear thing that you just have to solve? So the, yeah. Um, so the question is, how hard is the numerical optimization? Yeah. Um, truth is, I don't know. I suspect it's not that nice. Um, my, the, uh, the methodology here was ask Mathematica. Um, and Mathematica managed something, um, but it's, uh, but I, I don't think it's especially easy. Um, and in particular, if you go to like many more than seven levels, things start getting slow. Okay, thank you. All right, and finally, um, so a last question we might ask is, you know, can we do any better than LPL SRPT? than this kind of natural translation of SRPT, discretizing it into finitely many levels. And, um, and the short version is, um, and the short version is I'm running low on time, so I'm gonna speed up a bit, um, is that uh, it turns out maybe counterintuitively that if you use original size instead of remaining size, um, which basically means that if you take, if once a job arrives in the size bucket, it never steps down, it just stays at the same level the whole time, that's actually better for mean response. So uh, this policy is called LPLPSJF um, that, that doesn't have the step down. And LPLPSJF beats LPLSRPT for, for mean response. And so, and so to kind of answer our question, yes, yeah. Like, yeah, so here basically what you're saying is uh, you assign the priority based on the file size? Yeah. When and the that's file it. Come, okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, yeah. So I'm, I'm here. I'm calling it LPLPSJF. Um, we've actually secretly seen this on a previous slide. It's a very, it's a variation of this preemptive priority, where basically every job just comes in, gets assigned one bucket, and statically has that priority the whole time. And yeah, when you have a small number of buckets, that turns out to be better than SRPT than LPL SRPT. Yeah, that's very appealing. I was wondering, or can you also do like instead of static assignment, do the dynamic assignment based on the file size as a priority. So like if your like first bucket start to become empty, or uh, then you can move some of the job from second bucket to the first bucket in a dynamic way. So do dynamic load balancing, uh, but based on the file size. Okay, so the question, that's a good question. So the question is, can you like do better if you can dynamically shift where the cutoffs are? Right. Um, so the answer is on some level, yes, you can do better. A kind of trivial way you could do better is say, I'm gonna have two levels and the cutoff is always just above the size of the smallest job in the system. Mm -hmm. Then you're just doing SRPT. Now that's kind of silly. Um, and so I think formula, even just like formulating a model where kind of this is an interesting problem uh, or you know, is, that kind of takes into account that there's some cost of switching because you have to reconfigure something. Um, I think this is like a pro, an interesting next step. Um, but um, but with that said, I think that like the finding that in practice, you know, if you have five or six levels and you use the you know LPL PSJF with the load balancing heuristic, that's this purple line, you know, five five levels, you're within twenty percent for of SRPT. That's probably good enough um, for uh, for most systems. Yeah, um, that's especially very interesting. Given. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thanks. Yeah, this, so this is a this is a really counterintuitive result. We were really surprised to find this, um, and yeah.
And we know that we can actually do slightly better than LPLPSJF. There's something that's like provably a bit better, um, but it just is even more, it's like a little bit more complicated. And this is a really nice kind of simple recommendation, I think, for systems. So to kind of sum up our LPL, our limited priority level adventure, we found out that for high variance job size distributions, we need like five-ish levels. Um, and we can choose size cutoffs using a load balancing heuristic. And in fact, we don't even need to be as complicated as LPL SRPT. We don't need the steps down. LPL PSJF, which doesn't have steps down, is actually a bit better. OK, so that's like, uh, I think, uh, so that's kind of everything I wanted to say about limited number of priority levels. I have what is evidently like an entire talk's worth of material left. So I'm going to kind of jump to the jump to the good stuff, jump to the results. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, how we can use SOAP to study settings where preemption is restricted or costly. And, um, and specifically, sorry, I see there's like a, a line on the screen. Is it okay if I uh, clear annotations? Yeah, I don't know how, yeah, how the line came on. All right, oh, okay, got it. All right, thanks. Okay. So, um, okay, so let's talk about uh, in the last few minutes uh, uh, limited preemption. So I'm going to think again about scheduling packet flows and uh, in like a network. Um, and something that you know is true about packet flows is they're made up of packets. So um, and these packets are kind of discrete things. So you send one packet at a time. Packets have some like size, and you can't interrupt a packet while it's in service. And so, um, and so if you're scheduling, uh, if you're studying scheduling with packets, you have to take this into account. And so SOAP um, and this modeling scheduling policies as rank functions allows us to take this into account. Um, I'm going to walk through this quickly, but the short version is you can modify if you have a rank function and you want to study what that rank function looks like when you can only preempt at certain times, you can basically modify the rank function so that, um, uh, so that it kind of encodes the fact that you're never preempting except at specific agents, which in our case are going to be packet boundaries. And so uh, using kind of by taking a rank function and modifying it this way, we can, skip, we can study scheduling with packet flows. Um, but of course, another thing that's true of packets is that um, each packet has like you know, some amount of uh, you know, the data you really want to send, but it also has some header, which, you know, has metadata, like where are the packet's going, who it's coming from, um, uh, you know, its order, in the, its order in the job, in the flow. Um, and so each packet has some amount of overhead, which we're going to uh, call gap. And so a question you might ask is, um, if I'm designing, if, you know, I'm designing my data center network and, you know, uh, servers are sending packet flows between each other, um, and I've got, so, you know, then at, at my various switches, I'll have a certain job size distribution, like packet flow size distribution. I might have a certain load and I might know how big the headers are. And so, but maybe if, you know, in my data center network, I might get to decide how big my packets are. And so, so the natural question is how big should I make my packets? If I make my packets really big, then I don't have as much overhead, right? Because I have fewer packet headers. But if I make my packets really small, then I can schedule better because I can preempt jobs kind of uh, at, with less notice, right? If I want to preempt a job, but the packet is really big, then I have to wait until the end of the packet before I can preempt the job. And so uh, roughly speaking, uh, so uh, we, we ran a bunch of experiments, which I'll probably uh, run through very quickly for time. Uh, but the general message of the experiments is all the following is that as a function of packet size, mean response time ends up looking something like this. As your, when your packet's really big, you have pretty poor mean response time. As you make the packet smaller and smaller, mean response time gets better and better. And then all of a sudden, you add a bit too much overhead and your system becomes unstable and you're toast. And so you don't want to be toast. And so, and so we might ask, how can we, um, 
So kind of two things we want to do when kind of deciding packet sizes. What, first, we want to make sure we're not toast. We want to ensure that our system is stable. And second, we want to then you know, find out what the best packet size is. And similar to the uh, limited priority level stuff, we ran a bunch of numerical experiments. And the long and the short of it is we uh, came up with a formula um, for the minimum safe packet size. Um, this is actually a, this one's actually a simple proof um, and not just a heuristic. And then we came up with a heuristic that, you know, in a variety of settings, it seems to be pretty close to um, the optimal, the optimal packet size. Um, and, and so, but more than like, you know, more important than the specific formulas we came up with is the fact that you can use a tool like so to study this problem of how big should my packet sizes be. So um, that's how we've used SOAP to study preempti uh, preemption that's restricted or costly, specifically in the uh, case of uh, deciding packet sizes. Um, and the same logic applies when like in other settings, like jo you know, uh, jobs where you need to have checkpoints every once in a while to save work, um, same, same rules apply. Okay, and then um, lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, scheduling and kind of keeping keeping things simple. Um, and so um, I'm going to just walk through the main point of this in the next two minutes, and then I'll conclude the talk. So, so I told you a bit about this Gissens policy that is kind of what you do when you want to do SRPT, but you don't know sizes. You only know the size distribution. And so what Gissens does is it takes in a job size distribution. So here's an example, maybe jobs are size one, six, or 14. And Giddens, uh, the rank function has this big scary formula. And what you do is you compute that big scary formula and you get some function. Um, and, um, and so you might ask, is there anything simpler we can do? So uh, something that Vijay suggested uh, in a question earlier in the talk is, well, you know, let's forget this really complicated formula. Can we just, uh, if we're trying to decide a job's priority, can we just look at its expected remaining size? That is a conditional expectation. So this is a policy called CERT. Uh, stands for uh, shortest expected remaining processing time. And its rank function, you know, is a much simpler formula and ends up looking kind of qualitatively similar to Gibbs. It's still kind of a bunch, at a, you know, if you kind of look at it from far away, it looks like a bunch of tropicals. And so we might ask, can, can we use SERPT instead of Gittins, right? If we're gonna get a bunch of triangles at the end of the day, can we just do the simple? And for this job size distribution, SERPT and Gittins have nearly identical performance. And so, um, and so, you have the, but, so we're left with this trade-off where Gittins is really complicated and hard to compute. SERPT is simple, seems great, but doesn't have a guarantee. Uh, on its mean response. And there's no provable guarantee that serves a good idea. So I'm going to give uh, basically two answers to this question. Can serve to replace Gittins? Um, uh, Vijay, do you have a question or should I? Oh, no, no, I'm just listening, sorry. Okay, okay, sorry, you were unmuted, okay. So, okay, so, um, yeah, so I'm going to give two answers to this question. First, I'm going to give a, uh, practical answer, and then I'll give a quick, super quick theoretical answer. So in practice, if we're trying to figure out can SERP replace Gittins? Well, um, what we did is we basically generated a hundred different distributions that all kind of, you know, all were like a mixture of Gaussians with like various weights. And we tried first come first serve, we tried foreground background, we tried a couple of other poli policies and we tried SERP. And we compared all of those policies to Gittins. And so here's a, here's a kind of worst case uh, of each of those policies out of these 100 trials. Um, and you know, first come, first serve can be up to you know, twi more than twice as bad as Gittins. FB, this serve the job of least age, can be, sometimes it's really good, but sometimes it's really bad. SERPT was always within 8%. So if you're wondering what you should do in practice, the answer is basically just use SERPT. It, it's, it's pretty good. Um, now, if you're looking for an answer in theory, well, you know, just use SERP, it seems to work, isn't very satisfying. So we actually used SOAP to uh, find a policy 
that is just a simple assert, but still has a provable mean response time guarantee. And it's a kind of adaptation of SERPT, which we call MSERPT. Um, and the long and the short of it, I'm going to skip through the definition. But the long and the short of it is that we proved, you know, this is a theorem that MSERPT is always within a factor of five of mean response time of business. Now, five, you might be thinking, that's not a very small number. You know, is that actually any good? And so the first, the first thing is that in practice, MSERPT is usually about as good as SERPT. Usually, sometimes a little bit worse, occasionally better, um, but you know, almost always pretty much as good as SERP and thus pretty much as good as Gibbs. Um, and, uh, and it's also, um, also we actually prove a smaller number when the load is lower. And finally, this is the first constant ratio that's been proven for any policy. Um, and so the fact that this is possible to do at all, um, at least from a theory side, was a really, uh, was a, a uh, pretty big accomplishment. So that theoretical result appeared at Symmetrics in 2020. All right, and that, that pretty much concludes everything I wanted to talk about today. Um, I have, uh, so I've been meeting with various people um, and we've been talking about like, you know, places queuing theory for computer systems might go in the future. Um, I've got lots of ideas and I got lots more ideas talking to people today. Um, you know, like schedule, you know, uh, there's, you know, Lots of, I think, really interesting open problems in scheduling and computer systems that queuing theory can help with. Um, these include things like you know, scheduling in clusters where jobs occupy lots of servers. Um, or one of, my, uh, one of my kind of favorite kind of problems that I want to attack at some point is scheduling when rather than jobs being like complete or incomplete, jobs have some notion of like being partially complete. Like if, you, you know, if you're running gradient descent and you run it for a bit, and you have a pretty good performance of your machine learning model. But maybe you could do better. But you don't actually know if you could do better. Um, this is a case where completion versus not completion is not a binary thing. I think that's a really interesting question, uh, scheduling for this, these sort of non-binary completion jobs. OK, and then lastly, of course, um, you know, if uh, you have a problem that is related to scheduling that um, you want to talk about, um, I have some time uh, tomorrow uh, if you want to add yourself to the schedule, I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to talk. Um, okay, then there's a whole bunch of references, things I re uh, papers uh, referenced in this talk, um, and in the kind of other work I've done, and I'll leave this slide up, uh, which has kind of the things we focused on today, plus a little bit of other stuff if people are curious as I take questions. Thank you so much for your attention. Sorry for going a little bit over time. Oh no, that's fine. Thanks. Uh, so actually, I'm going to have Leigh. Lay was going to be a discussion, so he'll, he will ask you some questions as a part of that. So I'll let him uh, take the stage, and then thereafter, we can open it up more broadly. Okay. Thanks, Vijay. And also, uh, thanks, uh, Ziv, for this excellent talk. I guess I will just add a few items to the, to the uh, additional problems <laughs> we can look at. Uh, let me yeah. share my slide. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Uh, can you see my slide in the right more form? It's like in the presentation, presenter yeah, or mode or did the, okay. Oh yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, again, it's really exciting results, and I uh, enjoyed our talk very much. Uh, so the first question I have is, I just added this item uh, when I listened to your talk. Uh, I, I, I'm very much amazed by the size-based priority result act, um, from the experimental result you showed. It has uh, such a good performance compared with, for example, SRPT-based result. Uh, have you tried to look at from like theoretical perspective, can we actually uh, say anything or prove anything uh, uh, for that algorithm? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So, um, so there are some theoretical obstacles. So let me start with what is, uh, is no. Um, so there's a, last I knew it was a preprint, um, and but maybe it's been published by now. Uh, it was Yan Chen and Jing Dong at Columbia studied basically the two level case and asked, you know, what's the, what performance can you achieve with only two priority levels? 
And they basically, and what they showed is that if you do, if you have just two priority levels, then you can beat first come first serve asymptotic. Um, you can do better than mean response time scaling as one over one minus rho. I don't think they showed that you can approach SRPT, but they might have. I, um, in so fact, they, no, they, they use a strictly size based algorithm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's a, mm -hmm. so they basically did uh, what we called in the talk LPLP SJF with two levels, mm -hmm. uh, but they had a dynamic, a uh, dynamically changing uh, level as load mm -hmm. changed. Mm -hmm. And so this is and so this is a kind of heavy traffic analysis. Um, I think what's what's really interesting is that. Um, you know, in practice, we care not really about heavy traffic and we care about more than two levels, but still not that many levels. Um, and then like a last, so, and I should, one obstacle to kind of studying this in theory is that, um, so in theory, if you take a job size distribution that has infinite variance, so like an unbounded Pareto distribution, and you have limited priority levels and first come first serve tie breaking, no matter what you do, you'll have infinite mean response time because of that infinite variance. This is a kind of basic fact from queuing theory related to the PK formula. Um, so, um, and so like there is some sort of like in, you know, in the kind of worst case, theoretically, there really is just no good bound because you could have this infinite mean response time or arbitrarily big mean response time if you have arbitrarily large variance. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, it seems like th there should be some assumption we can make on the distribution and assumption we, you know, that kind of ends up making things work out. So I think that's an interesting question. Sorry, I spent probably way too much time answering that question, but uh, hopefully that was interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's, uh, I think, really exciting to know, even for two levels, like the result is yeah. very interesting. Yeah. So the, the, the other two items, I, I think they're basically uh, some suggestion about like what are the potential or uh, future problems like for people working in queuing can look at. I think uh, like in your second part of the talk, you'll talk about to model the packet overhead, right? And look at the uh, trade-off, like what's the sweet spot we, in terms of choosing the packet size. But I guess if we even go back to MG1 uh, model, not look at packet flow model, uh, if we have the switching cost, if we expressly model the switching cost, for example, very simply, the time, it may take certain amount of time to switch from one job to another then uh, what is the right priority value, right? To look at uh, that, that's maybe the age plus something, right? Uh, that'll be something interesting to, to look into. Uh, yeah. The second day is uh, now like in data centers, many jobs are not just require just for example, CPU, it require like many different type of sources, not, not many, but <laughs> a multiple source type of sources like the CPU, memory, maybe storage. Right. In this case, like, how do we do the scheduling? I think that that's also a very interesting question. So, if you have any idea on, on these two items, I'd be love to to hear about that as well. Yeah, these are both very interesting directions. Um, so, I'll start with the multiple resources because I um, the short version is this is I think a like classically very difficult problem, um, and. Um, and I think like from multi-server in, you know, in a multi-server system setting, people have looked at, you know, sort of multi-dimensional bin packing and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how much they've looked at it from a queuing perspective, mm -hmm. but rather just the sort of things arrive online and then you fill up your bins and you want to, you know, use as few as possible, that sort of stuff. Um, but I think, okay, so that, yeah. We, that we did have some work a uh, couple of years ago, look at this problem, but it's not really looking at the, like the, like, delay perspective, yeah. mainly look okay. at whether it can make the system stable or not. Okay, cool. I'd be interested to hear more about that, but that's, that already seems difficult because when you've yeah. got a multi-dimensional, uh, yeah. Um, as, as for the preemption costs, um, yeah, even in a single server setting, explicitly modeling preemption costs is very difficult. Um, with this said, so I know of one prior work that's done this. And then I've, I've been working on this myself with a student a little bit. So the prior work is that there's a, I think relatively little known paper uh, from by Carmelita 
uh, Georg, I don't know how to pronounce the last name, from like around 1990, that analyzes SRPT with switching costs. Mm -hmm. Basically in an MG1-like model that explicitly models, you know, how much time it takes to pause one job or to, I think it's, they model the time it takes to start up a job um, is the specific thing. And so that's really, um, and that's actually a remarkable analysis, not really well known, um, but it's still pretty limited in that. So for example, the switching costs are deterministic. Um, so um, recently I've been working with an undergraduate student, Edwin Peng um, at, at CMU. I think he's a senior now. Um, and uh, we've been working on kind of the, looking at an MG1 with uh, just preemptive priority scheduling where you have stochastic switching costs. Mm -hmm. And we like a couple of different types of costs. So for example, maybe there's, maybe if you're running a job and you wanna pause it, there's some cost to pause it, namely like, you know, saving its work. And then maybe when you wanna, you know, resume the job, you then have to reload that stuff. So that's another stochastic switching cost. Um, and we managed to get an exact analysis uh, of mean response time in this system. And we're preparing that for, for, uh, for submission. It appeared at the, in the student research competition at Sigmetrics. Uh, but I think that's still only a very small first step in what's a difficult problem. Uh, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, when it's ready, please send me a copy. I'd love to yeah, read it. Well, yeah. yeah. I it? think, uh, VJ, that's all the item I have. Uh, can, all right. No, thanks. Can like, so I just one I had a question, but then um, maybe others, anyone has a question too, they can first chime in. I'll let them do that before. I guess then I'll shoot my question and then you can. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so this is all for like MG1 type setup. So it's like Poisson arrivals. Yeah. And what happens if you shake that, um, the first Poisson arrivals part? Does, how, I mean, I know analysis is going to be hard, but are there, suppose you go to GG1, I mean, is there a way of using, I mean, here you're using the PK formula. I mean, you're not using the PK formula, but some analogies to that. Yeah. Is there a way to use some sort of Lyapunov thing to actually make some, at least get at something that is heavy traffic good and maybe it's good in practice afterwards? I know it's a speculative question. So, yeah. yeah. So that yeah. So the question is basically, um, yeah. What if we don't have Poisson arrivals? So, so answer. So there are a couple of answers to the question, or a couple aspects to the answer. So the first aspect is that. If you're just worried about modeling bursts, then we can we can kind of get part way there because we can um, all of the results. Um, we haven't written this up for in most in most of the papers, but they can be generalized to batch plus all arrivals, which kind of adds some extra variability to the arrival process, um, and. Um, of course, that's only one very specific type of variability. Um, moreover, sometimes you actually want to model less variable arrival processes. Like if you've got um, you know, many server dispatching system and you're dispatching jobs round robin to the servers or using some other kind of uh, dispatching policy that kind of smooths out the arrivals, then you have something that's less variable than Poisson. Um, basically, we don't really know how to handle that because all of the SOAP magic is based off of um, the magical properties of busy periods when you have Poisson arrivals. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, as soon as you lose that, you lose all sorts of nice things that make uh, everything a lot harder. Um, like when you have you know, one busy period followed by another busy period, you can't just, you, you, um, if you have Poisson arrivals, their expected lengths are just, you, know, you just add them. When you have non-Poisson arrivals, you have to think, okay, well, what's the state of the arrival process at the end of the first busy period? Everything gets way worse. So um, I think it's a difficult problem. Well, thank you. And uh, if there are no more questions, I should thank you once again for a excellent talk. Um, and thanks again for meeting with others tomorrow as well. And good luck with your job search. Thanks. Thanks everybody for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Great talk. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.